Hello, I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics, and welcome to this 90th anniversary celebration of one of the greatest horror films ever made and one of my personal favorites, Island of Lost Souls. It is an honor to be joined by award-winning author, journalist, and film historian, Mr. David Delval. How are you doing today, David? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm really excited about this. Island of Lost Souls is one of my absolute favorites. And uh, we're talking so much about pre-code horror now. This is the absolute quintessential pre-code horror movie because it literally was released without too many uh, details missing uh, from what would have been severely cut just a couple of years later, like after 1936. Can you give our audience a little bit of a refresher? Uh, if they're not familiar with the pre-code era, what did that mean? Basically, it meant this, that while there was a code, a production code in Hollywood that was around even in the late 20s, it was not enforced to the degree that it would be after films like Todd Browning Spreaks, Island of Lost Souls, uh, particularly Freaks. Uh, and Mae West uh, kind of pushed the buttons at Paramount with She Done Him Wrong. So by the early 30s, there was a real kind of uproar about uh, what people were being subjected to in movies because there was absolutely no, you know, all kinds of things were implied, particularly in gangster films. It was all there. And so by 1936, the horror uh, boom was in a wane because the English, because the Brits wouldn't uh, allow us to export after the Raven 1935 with Lugosi and Karloff. They simply put a ban on them. So from 36 to 39, there were very few horror films that were made that were released around the world. So movies like Island of Lost Souls are very important. Plus, it's the first adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, Island of Dr. Moreau. And Dr. Moreau is played by the incredibly talented, iconic Charles Lawton, who had just come to Hollywood a year or so before to do The Devil in the Deep and The Sign of the Cross, both for Paramount. He was a unique actor, uh, very talented, both on stage and on screen, troubled personal life. But his Dr. Moreau is one of the great mad scientists of the cinema of which there are quite a few, but his is right on the top of the, he's the Mount Everest of mad doctors is what he is. Oh, he's certainly up there. Now, the early 1930s was a golden age for horror because this is when we had Universal Pictures giving us Todd Browning's Dracula, Frankenstein directed by James Whale, The Mummy. So this started certainly a horror boom in that era. And a lot of these films were based off of 19th century Gothic literature like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But what's interesting is though, even though Universal is the studio most associated with the monster movie or the horror genre, you look at the films that Paramount was making or MGM was making, movies like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Freaks, The Mask of Fu Manchu. It seems like those movies, even by today's standards, they go harder in the horror department than Universal did. Why is that? Well, because Universal, of course, was riding on the crest of the success of the Lon Chaney Sr. Todd Browning movies that were done over at MGM, like West of Zanzibar, you know, London After Midnight. Uh, the thing was, the studios were run by immigrants from Germany and, and from East, Eastern Europe. So they were steeped in uh, the Gothic tradition, the Germans you know, were very dark. Their fairy tales were very dark. That's really where horror started in the black forests of Germany with puppet shows that depicted werewolves and vampires and things like that. So Dracula, uh, Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, these were all public domain. But the main thing with Dracula was it was success on Broadway in 1927 and Lugosi was playing it, but it was all going to be Lon Chaney Sr., when Cheney died in 1930, it put uh, the studio in chaos and Karloff and Lugosi became the reigning stars of the 30s, but it was purely accidental. Karloff was an extra. Lugosi had been the star on Broadway, but his English was very poor. But it did kickstart, Dracula especially, kickstarted the horror boom of the 30s. But remember, Paramount 
was the studio that took the most chances. Universal was not a chance taking institution. They relied on formula. And oddly enough, in today's world of sequels, do you realize that both Dracula and Frankenstein, big hits that they were, box office giants, they did not get around to making sequels to either one of them for five or six years. If yeah. that had been done today, there would have been 10 Draculas within four years. Yeah. There that was been, the difference. There would have been a Dracula cinematic universe. Oh, exactly. Or a Frankenstein. So, you know, I mean, they got kind of silly in Karloff's view with Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. But I think we all realize that of all the horror comedies ever made, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is the best. It's, and it's, it's very rare to blend horror and comedy. And yeah, you have to look at things like uh, Return of the Living Dead or uh, The Lost Boys in today's market for, for humor and horror together. But that was a very, it was a huge hit too. Well, speaking of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and especially Dracula, there is some connective tissue from those films in Island of Lost Souls. The fact that they got Lugosi to play Dracula again, which believe me, he had to, he had to fight for that part which is disgusting considering yeah. Universal owed him. But see, that's the thing. And uh, horror fans are very much aware of the dis disparaging ways that Lugosi was treated during his career, considering what an enormous icon he became in the horror genre. He's more popular today than Karloff, truly. Probably, but you know, where was Lugosi? Like he, he was a man whose career had tremendous highs and very deep lows. Where was he in 1932 at that point in his career? Covered in hair on Catalina Island, making Island of Lost Souls. I, I think I mentioned earlier, we didn't talk about it on camera, but Lugosi was Hungarian. So in the Hungarian theater world, you played a big role one day and a walk on the next. It didn't matter. You just gave, you did what you were told. You were given roles, you played them. So Lugosi brought that over to Hollywood. And I don't think his English was all that clear. And at Universal, uh, he didn't strike a very good deal. 1932, he's one year having been an, a sensation in Dracula. He does the Black Cat in 34. But from 31 to 33, he does White Zombie for what was shot on the Universal lot for what was a United Artist, Victor Halperin. Then he did this one, Island of Lost Souls. And then he did... Uh, um, Shandu the Magician. He did all these kind of, uh, but playing the sayer of the law in this, he's tremendous. And if you saw him as Igor and Son of Frankenstein, it just dis it dis dispels any idea that he was an actor with very little range. He had lots of range. He was just, and he was very unique. But he should he have been an Island of Washington? Yes. It's a prestige movie. He got to work with Lawton. Uh, but it was, he should have had a bigger part. In fact, truly, he could have played Dr. Moreau. If he had, played, have, Dr. If he had played Dr. Moreau, it would have been fabulous. It wouldn't have been the perverse kind of pre-code willies that this one has with Lawton in it, because he's just amazing. Um, but that's what happened to Lugosi's career. He didn't manage it well. And frankly, he was only paid $500 to do White Zombie. $500 in the money of, two, of 1931, 32. But that's still, Karloff was making far more money, made far better deals. And when the horror boom was, was you know, when the, the pre-code thing happened and you couldn't make these for three years, Lugosi went into a tailspin financially. Karloff just went off and did uh, straight roles. Like, well, straight being, you know, west of Shanghai, uh, the Lost Patrol for John Ford. He just did... And it gave the impression, and it may be so, that he was a bit more versatile than Lugosi. He certainly was had the advantage of being English because the language was not a problem for Karloff. But Island of Lost Souls is a tremendous movie, and Lugosi's line readings of things like, what is the law? Not to spill blood. And well, then, of course, that... Him? Yeah, the, well, Devo, if we yeah. can't mention that Devo made a big... A, 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 immortalized this in a way. So, uh, but I think anyone that's coming to Island of Lost Souls for the first time should play close attention to the makeups, close attention to the performance of Kathleen Burke as Lota, and watch the way Charles Lawton cracks that whip. 
because he took lessons from Lash LaRue, of all people, to learn how to crack. And he cracked that whip after he made the movie. He just loved it. I think Lawton was made to have a whip. <laughs> I mean, this was the film that, made, I mean, Charles Lawton, incredible actor, long career, a lot of amazing films. But certainly when I was a kid watching this for the first time, this was the first movie I saw where he made a, a tremendous impression. Oh, he did on everyone. I yeah. mean, when he says the, the natives are restless in this, he's not kidding. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So uh, this is an incredibly perverse film. It's very creepy and atmospheric, even by today's standards. There's some stuff in this movie that'll definitely make some people in the audience uncomfortable. What does our audience have to look forward to in the next 70 minutes? Well, first of all, you're gonna see a story play out that while it's fantastic, the acting, the fact that Lawton is committed to the point that you can't separate him from playing Dr. Moreau. And I, what they should notice is that in the dialogue, he's supposed to be much older. He was only like 30 years old when he played this. But if you notice, they put pancake on him. They put false eyebrows on him to leave the impression that maybe Dr. Moreau had a facelift. Really? Okay. Yes, okay. because he's supposed to be about 50 He's approaching 60 yeah. in the novel. So, but look at that. His makeup makes him look like he may be not quite like Lionel Atwell in Mystery of the Wax Museum, maybe sure. later. But it's an interesting point that I had not noticed for a long time. This is the kind of movie that's very rich in those kind of details. And uh, notice the way the captain is that, that puts our friend off on the island that stinks from one end of the coast to the other is that he's an alcoholic. Yeah. And it's kind of a thing there because remember, we're a, a year away from King Kong. So maybe we're, if there's just certain things, and, and of course, we cannot talk about Island of Lost Souls without mentioning the most dangerous game. Yeah. Made, made the same year with Leslie Banks and uh, Fay Ray, because that was using the sets for King Kong, the, because they were still in production with both. And that had a character that's not unlike Dr. Moreau, Count Zaroff, played by the great Leslie Banks, who had a one side of his face was paralyzed. So you didn't know it. It was something only the directors and the cast knew. But it's why he always struck these particularly Prussian-like poses. Because, and he's a sadist in this. I think the one thing that we see that was removed after the production code was enforced more were people playing sadism, people that were into inflicting torture. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that make hostile and all those things that are in today's movies, the torture porn movies. This is probably the closest thing to the, the grandfather of torture porn. Oh, absolutely. But like, as you mentioned, 1932 and 1933 were pretty big years for jungle horror. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. Between King Kong, Most Dangerous Game, Island of Lost Souls, and other offshoots from you Paramount, of course, like Murders in the Zoo, I which love also Zoo. has Kathleen Burke, who plays Lota. She's introduced as Lota, and a very beautiful Kathleen Burke. And she made a number of movies at Paramount. But Murders in the Zoo is one you should show. It's definitely pre-code with the wonderful Lionel Atwell at the height of his career. Well, oh, that's a that's also a personal favorite. That opening scene, it's as shocking as anything you'll he see. He didn't before. say a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll screen that another time, but I'm Absolutely. definitely yeah, it's a lot of fun. But even like when going back to the jungle horrors, you even had Tarzan the Ape Man at MGM, which might as well be a horror movie. Well, and it there's is, one of the Tarzans yeah. that has a scene with vampire bats in it. That, oh, that's uh, right. Is one of the early ones. Yeah, but those are a lot of fun. But without further ado, directed by Earl C. Kenton, uh, we will be presenting Island of Lost Souls. Please stick around after the movie for some cool behind the scenes trivia. So enjoy the film. Wow, what a movie. I'll tell you, it stays with you forever. Oh, absolutely. And there's very little music in it too. So it's quite, it's, it's not, it's got a documentary feel to it in a way, especially absolutely. the scenes with the do in the house of pain, you know. A lot of those movies from the early thirties, they take advantage of rear screen projection. You can tell the shot on a soundstage, but here we can see them. They're on an actual boat. You see the water, the ocean. So where, you said all of that was filmed on Catalina? 
Yeah, most of it. There were some interiors done at the studio, but like right. Freaks, like Todd Browning's Freaks, both movies end with the with the the creatures overwhelming the the villain and doing horrible things to them. In in the case Olga Baklanova's turned into a chicken, you know, a, she's a freak because they take knives, they cut her all up in the in the storm. Yeah. Same thing in this. The 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 mammal men take him into the house of pain, and the camera lingers. In fact, the first time you see Lawton in the House of Pain with his assistant, that drunken doctor that he's blackmailed into helping him, yeah, you can see him working on somebody who's screaming because the big deal with vivisection is you don't use anesthesia. Right. Well, well that's why it's the House of Pain, right? Exactly. It's awful. It's hideous. And so there's nothing about this movie that's pleasant, but yet it's so it's so expertly made and it's so grim. Mm -hmm. But the acting, it's just a great movie. And you know what? It doesn't age like a lot of movies. And this is a film that's been done two or three times officially. In 1977, you have The Island of Dr. Moreau with Burt Lancaster. And then, of course, and you Michael have York. Yeah. Michael York. And of course, the, the infamous 1996 version starring Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. With, with Mini Me, his little Mini Me. I'm very fond of that version. I know it didn't do well, but I think it's a great, I think if you like the, the subject matter, you shouldn't avoid it. It's definitely worth your time. And Marlon Brando is every bit as interesting as Charles Lawton. Oh, In absolutely. Fact, more so because he takes it to the next level, yeah. whatever that level may be. But Lugosi is the one to watch in that. And as I told you earlier, I was a big still collector at one time. And I also was, you know, uh, working, doing photo credits and stuff with, with Forey Ackerman for Famous Monsters. So when Forey died, a lot of his things, you know, were available. And I got these original, out of Lugosi's own scrapbook, test makeups that I'm sure you've seen before. But yes. here they are. You know, you can see here, it's taken the back from his photo album. And wow. here is uh, Bela Lugosi in the... And as you can see, it's a goatee. It's more of a satanic look. And most of his face is where you can see it. Yeah. And here's a full view of it right here yeah he certainly makes a much more dashing sayer of the law hat they have gone in that he looks more like a satyr like he might be the great god pan like a, he's a ghost and here's what here's a, a this is from the national film archive this is how he looks are we not men oh you yeah made us not men things <laughs> his dialogue reading of that is fabulous and uh no, you know, I mean, I'm, I, it's just such a, I'm so glad we have these movies. And as we've talked about privately, we want people to watch them. We don't want people to give up on black and white movies or movies that are 60, 70 years old, because there's much to be learned. And there's really nothing in cinema now that hasn't been, you know, except for the fact we're not using real film anymore. Everything's digital. Yeah. And the fact that through blue screen and green screen, we can do. So all I have to say about that is, OK, everybody, you can now film Lovecraft. Now we're living. I mean, I, I know most people are acclimated to staying at home. They have their big screen TVs. It's all about streaming. But thanks to these boutique labels like the Criterion Collection, Kino Lorber, Arrow, I don't think it's been a better time to be a collector of Golden Age Hollywood film. I would, couldn't agree with you more. I have just, I just put on Instagram yesterday that I just passed my 50th audio commentary for Kino Lover. Oh, wow. I've done, and I'm sure I've probably done a couple. I've done 55 by now. But when I thought I got close to 50, I thought I better acknowledge it and acknowledge the company. Because oh, yeah. Frank Tanzi and the people that work at Kino have been very nice to give me the opportunity to talk about all kinds of movies, all genres, which is great. But I, yeah, like you, I always, my heart is always with the pre-code horrors. I'm a big Blu-ray DVD collector myself, but to me, nothing beats the rare opportunity of seeing this, these films on the big screen the way they were intended. Well, I felt that, well, you just mentioned The Naked Jungle. Yeah. I watched it on my TV, but that movie, Guy Madden showed that at uh, the Arrow years ago. Guy Madden, the director, the Canadian director. His two favorite movies were The, the Naked Jungle and 40 Guns with Barbara Stanwyck. Mm -hmm. Very camp movies. But then Guy's movies are very camp. And uh, that would, but yeah, no, there's no, this is why the new Beverly here in LA is so important because they show a number, you know, not as much as they should, in my opinion. I wish they would, show more obscure movies 
Because it's kind of funny to go to a theater and see a movie you've got sitting on a shelf. It's all about the audience energy. And then seeing yeah. it, the, you look at the framing of the shots, it's one thing to watch it on TV, but when it's up there 30 feet high, you pay more attention to the composition, the lighting, the way everything was framed. And you see that like, there's like little subtle intricacies that you see, say on Charles Lawton's face or in Bela Lugosi's eyes, yeah, that you yeah. doesn't really pick up at home. Well, um, I did a pre-code with Lawton for Kino called The Devil in the Deep, which oh, was that's like, a great one. It yeah. says introducing Charles Lawton. Yeah. And he slaps Tallulah Bankhead crosshand, and the camera goes back to Tallulah, and you can see the imprint of his knuckles on her cheek. And yeah. until it was cleaned up, I'm sure if you watch that on TV, you'd miss that. Yeah. But I, I just watched two Ernst Lubitsch movies at Quentin's Theater, and you notice things. And also, the one thing, that you have to do, and you have, and you, people that don't, naughty, naughty, is when you're in a theater, you're not on your phone. Yeah. I'm guilty of it too. If I'm at home and I'm watching stuff sometimes for research, I'll get on my phone. It's just yeah. a habit. I'll get on my phone, just maybe, oh, someone texted me, let me see what they want. And then that opens the rabbit hole to start looking at all this other stuff. Yeah. And you don't watch what you're, you know, the only way to see a great movie is in the theater. Something like Paul Newman and HUD. What a fantastic movie to see on a big screen because of James Wong House photography. Yeah, but I would be remiss not to mention as great as Charles Lawton is, as amazing as Bela Lugosi is, I wanna give a shout out to Richard Arlen, Kathleen Burke, Arthur Hall. We're just, they're all incredible in the movie. They're so incredibly naturalistic. And I think their believability sells the sort of absurd nature of what's happening. Well, yeah, and you know, Richard was kind of a matinee idol. I think he's the perfect all-American boy type that juxtaposed with the exotic panther woman. But you mentioned earlier Charles Lawton's personal life. He was a very conflicted actor, and wh why was that? Well, first of all, I think in the 30s, and in that period of time, being gay was something you had to conceal. And remember, Charles Lawton was married to Elsa Lanchester, who I was privileged to be around for a little bit in 1977. And uh, she had said the most extraordinary thing. She said, when Charles, we were sitting on this sofa in our little apartment and Charles sat me down and said, Elsa, I've got something to tell you. I'm attracted to men. And she said, Charles, we'll handle it, but I wanna ask you one thing. And he said, what is it, Elsa? We have to get rid of this sofa. <laughs> that, that's what she was like so for her removing the sofa where he told her he was gay was part of the process in her dealing with it mm -hmm. and then she would find herself attracted to some of the very handsome young men that we could you see that all the actors would go to charles because he was an incredible teacher and i don't have to not talk about charles lawton without mentioning night of the hunter yeah, one of, of the 10 yeah. greatest movies ever made and one of the great acting, one of the great directing debuts, it is a crime this man did not direct another movie. Yeah. Robert Mitchum is astonishing. Lawton got a performance out of him that no one else could have. And it was funny because Bob Mitchum being the great guy that he was, when Charles told him, he said, Bob, I got something to tell you. And Mitchum goes, yeah, what daddy? And he goes, uh, I'm attracted to men. And you know what, when you know what Mitchum said to him? No shit. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? I can't he think of it. He could care less. You know, he could care less. And that's the way most people should be anyway. Right. No shit. That's great. See, you know, you don't think people talk like that in the 50s, but they did. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The only thing that's new under the sun is Barbie. <laughs> I'm a huge Bela Lugosi fan. I'm a huge pre-code fan. If my commentaries or articles or anything do any good at all, please don't ignore old films because they're old. Because remember, they're, if you've never seen them, they're not old because you haven't seen them. So that's my, if you follow that advice, David Del Val wishes you what I used to say years ago, 70 millimeter nightmares.
Why I said that, I don't know. I looked at some old tapes and I said that. But yeah, anyway, yeah. and I think what you're doing is great, Ryan. I hope Thank you will you so stick much. with it, even though it's a hot day and a cold wind in August, a raw wind in Eden, a hot day in Houston, you know. Yeah. Yeah, go into those icy, you know, that used to be the big thing in the summer when I lived in Sacramento was 100% freezing in here. And people would go in the movies. They didn't care what it was. They just wanted to get in and be comfortable. Well, we're definitely appreciating that sentiment right now. Thank you, Mr. David Dildal. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, and Ryan, always a pleasure to talk. All right. And for you guys in the audience, I hope you guys have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>